you look at an IT portfolio, right? Every leader that's running IT, I'm sure, like, you know, we're thinking about, it's not one size fits all. We have to pull out different tools for different problems in front of us. And it also depends on the scale of the project and the risk of the project. Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter Hyde. My guest today is Deepika Rayala. Deepika is the Chief Digital and Information Officer of Cornerstone On Demand, a cloud-based people development software provider and learning technology company. It's currently owned by private equity. Deepika has been in role for about two years, and she's been involved in pulling three acquired companies together to form the current uh, instantiation of the company. She's also developed a digital academy to help her team build the skills of tomorrow, among a variety of transformations that she's led during her tenure. Prior to her current role, Deepika was the Chief Information Officer and International Operations Center Lead of Yext. Deepika, welcome to Technovation. It's great to see you today. Good to be here, Peter. Yes. Well, Deepika, I, I uh, mentioned briefly uh, an overview of Cornerstone On Demand's business. I wonder if you could take it from there and provide a little more color as to the, the, uh, the company that you help lead. We are a pioneer and the largest company that is focused on learning and talent management with about 7,000 customers. So when you look at just that vertical of learning and talent management, and we have some impressive numbers to tout. We have 125 million users across the globe, 2.5 billion course registrations, and every three seconds, there is a user somewhere in the world doing a course on the Cornerstone platform. So hope that gives you a preview of who we are. Indeed, that's a great a great overview and indeed some very impressive uh statistics you've offered as well for to, to, to offer that color. Um, Deepika, also, could you talk a bit more about your role as Chief Digital and Information Officer, please? Yeah. So, Peter, I manage all of our internal facing IT platforms and operations, apps, data, uh, IT operations, corporate security. I also run our internal Gen AI rollout and the adoption. We're just starting to, I would say, you know, scratch the surface in terms of broader end-to-end digital view across our value chain. The last two years has been very focused on just building and establishing this foundation that you talked about. So we are now starting to sort of connect the dots and build value on top of it. Yeah, very interesting. And I mentioned in the introduction that uh, a part of what you've undertaken in the company, of course, more broadly, is bringing several companies together to form the current iteration of Cornerstone On Demand. Can you talk a bit about um, that work, which sounds like very substantial uh, in, in terms of building the, the company as it stands now? Sure. So we called it the North Star program, right? And so this has definitely been a heavy lift over the last 18 months for a cross-functional team. So what we did was literally we re-implemented a new CRM and ERP across our four companies, three of which were acquisitions over the last three years. So this involved uh, also uh, refactoring about 50 peripheral apps that connect to these core platforms and also bringing to life our overall data lake with consolidated analytics, which was very difficult to do before the North Star program because we were stitching data together from these four companies and Excel spreadsheets and it was a very cumbersome process. So so it's definitely been a a big effort, but a, a really important effort that I think is now helping us operate as one cornerstone. Wonderful, and I know, uh, as you mentioned in the, at the outset, part of your responsibilities include artificial intelligence, uh, which no doubt is brought to life a bit more easily by having a better data program and foundation that you have laid uh, in recent years. I, I know you also have some really interesting nuanced uh, approaches and thought processes associated with AI, generally speaking, generative AI more specifically, uh, you, you, in past conversations, you refer to it as frugal IT or frugal innovation. Talk a bit about what you mean by that, please. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think if I step back a little bit, right, a Peter, like, you know, when you look at an IT portfolio, right, every leader that's running IT, I'm sure, like, you know, we're thinking about it's not one size fits all. We have to pull out different tools for different problems in front of us. And it also depends on the scale of the project and the risk of the project. So when I look at something like Knockstar, right, you go with a tier one consulting firm, like you definitely have larger teams, low risk, you know, there's a lot at stake, right? And when you look at platforms like CRM and ERP or like even a forecasting tool or a data lake, you know, it's a given, right? No one's going to try and build something because they've been around for a long time. They pretty much do 
80 to 90% of what you want, and then you're doing the rest of the stuff, right? So on the other end of the spectrum are, I mean, there's a middle here where I feel like, you know, when you build a data lake, for example, I feel it's in the middle. Yeah, you get Snowflake, yeah, you get t- Tableau, but there's a context within the company that you need to bring to life, which is all customized and built, right? And at the other end of the spectrum to me are like this up and coming Gen AI. I'm talking here now in the context of employee productivity and business operational efficiencies. And, um, I, and I would say today that it's not yet at, at a place where you could easily roll this out to like even a 5,000 people company without spending anywhere from three to $4 million, if you really want to you know, make it happen. So what I mean by that is we hear a lot about co-pilots. We hear a lot about uh, best in breed applications in that space that are like, hey, if you buy beautiful AI, you could do like these customized PowerPoint templates. And then you have you know, something else for like, you know, meeting notes. So they're all like different apps and they all add up. What I mean by that is by the time you get even like an open AI license and a few of these sort of productivity apps, you know, it quickly adds up to thousand dollars per user a year, right? So now multiply that for, by the number of thousands of employees you have, it gets to a place where it's hard to make it happen in a way that you're giving it to all employees. Now, companies can choose to say, you know what, Um, I'll only give it to my product team or my sales team because I'm only focused on this 200 people first getting productive. That can be an approach. But the approach that we took is, no, we want to actually give it to all our employees um, and, and help them with some of these general productivity tools. So in that context, I feel like it's not a bad idea right now to be able to build certain things on top of open APIs. So we can actually scale that at a much lower cost. Now, it may not be as slick as getting like uh, an independent license for every single employee from OpenAI, but we can get to 70% of that functionality by using something like Azure OpenAI and building a skin on top of it. Now, the cost variance of that is five to 10X. So in that context, like what what we think about in the framework is, does it have a two to three year life value so that you get the return of investment on productivity and operational efficiency in that time span so that your build investment is justified because three years from now, the prices may come down. We may be getting all these licenses at $10 per user, who knows, right? But we still see value in doing that in some circumstances. That's a really creative approach. And I know a lot of your peers are worried about just that, that the the total cost of ownership, so to say, of making these investments and then deploying them and uh, across an entire enterprise can really add up quickly. And so uh, fascinating to hear about some of the approaches you've taken to achieve a lot of the value for a lot less of the cost. Thank you so much for sharing some of that. And your your really great points about uh, it may eventually get to the point where the economics are viable for the buy option. But uh, in building, there's a lot of uh, a lot of advantages as well. Beyond the 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 cost advantages, are there, do, do you get the sense that there is more learned through the build process? Uh, in other words, um, in bringing, in in, in uh, attempting to accomplish a lot of what would be there in some of the professional grade tooling and building that yourself, having your teams do so, are there certain skills um, that you see growing as a result of some of those work? Yeah, I, I see two things there. One is I think we understand the needs of our business. And if I were really like to understand the day in the life of someone in my marketing team and sales team and product team or an engineering team, we understand that better now because they're coming and telling us what makes them productive, right? So there is definitely a deeper, like when we buy an off the shelf tool and give it to them, we roll it out, but we don't necessarily always get into those deep dive discussions. So yes, I see a a bit of that. But I see that more when we build a business operational efficiency apps. Like what I mean by that is like, say if you were to build like an order validation tool, right? So you need to deeply understand what a set of people in a certain part of the company are doing day in and day out from, uh, from a manual process perspective for us to be able to then translate it. And, and again, this is not going to be full automation. We're still at a place where it's still human in the loop. But still, you know, be able to take 75% of the burden and, you know, shift it over to a model that can then spit out something to them. So definitely a lot of learning there. Um, and I can tell you that even if you were to buy an off-the-shelf tool for some of those there, you know, those 
areas, there is still customization you would need to do to make it work in our context. Really interesting uh, uh, notions and the necessity, of course, to weave oneself very much into the broader business to understand uh, the potential use cases or areas of value that can be derived as a result of implementing some of these innovations. As you continue those conversations, and you've already offered some really interesting and compelling use cases that are adding to productivity, for example, um, any others that you see or you're particularly excited about as you look to the ongoing sort of uh, uh, unfolding of this across the the enterprise? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, every company you know, has to take this strategy in the context of you know, their company, whether it's budget, whether it's how does the executive leadership look at AI being rolled out and also the business context. So the, what I'm also excited about, Peter, is that there are certain niche tools that are very useful, I think, in the context of certain functional areas, right? So when we do this process as well, and this is why we work on specifically the Gen AI and the digital rollout in a very decentralized fashion because we want the business to run at the pace that's right for them. So if there's someone sitting in marketing and there's a lot of work they need to do on you know, copywriting and all of that, then they need a tool that fits the purpose. And that doesn't, that doesn't apply to all 5,000 people in the company. It applies to those 10 people in that department. So in both areas, it's actually great when you have a niche and a, a tool that really works for them, they should just go buy it, right? So we so we have a decentralized uh, process right now that says if there's a specialized tool that serves the business purpose and it fits our security needs, go buy it. If there's a broad-based uh, you know, need across the company for everyone in the company to be able to have a basic Gen AI query tool, for people to put in Excel spreadsheets and have some, you know, the system do the formulas for them, like those kinds of general productivity, like we're leaning towards this low cost model that we talked about. So, so there's kind of a, a, a good mix there. And I think uh, we should keep an eye on that and, and keep shifting the balance as the economics get better and better. Oh. I know uh, from our past conversations, as I mentioned in the introduction, that you've been very cognizant of the necessity to create the ability to build the, the skills of the future for your team uh, and beyond your team, presumably as well. I, you've developed what you refer to as a digital academy. Can you talk a bit about how you've thought about building it and the types of tools you use and frankly, even the sorts of skills you're building through it? Yeah, yeah. So two pieces there. One is we've definitely in the last year even initiated the concept of an enterprise digital team uh, with a lot of focus on like employee experience and productivity. So that, uh, so we don't have a large team, like for our size of the company, we're about 4,300 or 500, uh, you know, employees. We have, a, uh, you know, six to eight people in our digital team, right? So on the core skill sets there, you know, are, are really around, you know, enabling enterprise digital AI. We are a Microsoft shop. So we do focus quite a bit on having skill sets around the Azure platform, as well as the Power Platform and Power Automate, because when you look at deploying these tools, it's not just about Gen AI. At the end of the day, it's a combination of things, right? There's BPA, there's RPA, there is, you know, the, the Microsoft tools that we have. So it's usually a combination of all of those. Um, and we have some mobile skill sets there as well. So one is like skilling that team uh, or right skilling that team is something we focused on over the last year. Now, um, in terms of Digital Academy, I mean, I would I would be transparent and say it's, it's a vision of mine and I am getting there. I'm not quite there yet. And we are a learning and, you know, learning and talent management company. We do this for companies around the world where we help them roll out their digital academies, whether it's for the whole company or lines of business. Um, and I, I personally think as a CIO, you know, forget about like a company, I think for any CIO to be able to have like a turnkey solution where you step in and you're able to like have a digital academy that you know helps map your skill sets of your resources to the projects you have and if you want to do you know 10% of it towards innovative comforts type of stuff like who are the people that want to stretch and get into roles that are not a part of their daily rhythm right so to have um you know to to have that that skills view to have career pathing view, to have that uh, sort of here's all the, the ways in which you can self-learn and the content to self-learn, like having that all in one place and having a really 
uh, useful and practical digital academy is something we are working towards. Um, I, it's, it's a goal of mine this year, but I would say we're not quite quite there yet. But I, I deeply, I really like how you you frame that almost as though you're kind of a customer zero. You, you're at least you're, you're you're drawing upon the insights of the very you know the the products and services that your organization uh, provides to others. It's sort of uh, drinking your own champagne, so to say. Yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to be that customer zero, and I I'm waiting to show that to a lot of my colleagues in the industry. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, boy, we've already talked about a number of important trends. I wonder if you, as you look to the future, are any others that you would underscore that particularly excite you as you look to the future? Uh, I mean, definitely, we talked a lot about generative AI and the ability to automate and provide value to users. And I would specifically, you know, uh, say in the flow of work. I think that's really where the power is, right? It's not like I've done all this stuff, it's sitting somewhere, right? It's like, it has to be a part of the work that they do on a daily basis at the right time, at the right place. So that to me, I think is powerful. And, you know, combine that with the power of data, right? Gleaning both, both what's evident and what's not evident. And it's not, you don't have to go into each particular application and search for something and having that more sort of um, enterprise search across the board, very powerful. And then combine that with the power of quantum computing. I know that still has a long ways to go. I just think, you know, it's going to be a you know a great time you know in the future. And the one other thing I would say is you know hybrid work. Um, and the reason I called it out is it's not like the most recent trend, but I think in all of this we can't lose sight of the people that actually make the work happen, right? So it's like how do you empower your employees to do their best and focus on delivery and outcomes and not necessarily where they are. And to me, I personally love the concept of hybrid work because it's not, again, one size fits all. I have people that come and say, I love coming to the office. I have people that say I'm super productive working remotely. So I just the whole concept, I think, is it, it has been really good. Yeah, very well said. I also wanted to, to ask uh, Deepika, now as a, a tech and digital executive multiple times over, um, what have been some of the difference makers for you as you, you, as you reflect upon your rise to become a C-suite executive? Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously, you know, gained a lot from watching a lot of leaders around me over the years. But I would say for me, if I were to like summarize it, I would say um, it's leading with authenticity, empathy, situational leadership, and resilience. Like those are the four things that really kind of stand out for me. And so when I say being genuine, you know, for me as a person, I show up the same way in all scenarios, whether I'm managing my team, I'm working with my peers, I'm interacting upward or outward with external parties, I, it's the same me, right? Um, when I say leading with empathy, it's like walking the talk and you know making actions speak louder than words. Um, and really listening. Um, and to me, situational leadership has come to play so many times, like there is no prescriptive leadership style. I think we have to be flexible and be aware of our context and environment. Um, and finally, resilience, you know, I can't underscore that enough. Um, I think um, it's some, some of it, I think, is in people's DNA and some of it, I think, can be learned. But um, I'm one of those people, You, I, I, I don't give up on a goal that we set up unless I truly, you know, feel like from a lot of data points that, you know, investing more time in it is diminishing returns and it actually probably better to fold something up. So um, those are some of the things that I think, at least for me, have served me well through my career. That's a great, a great overview, uh, leading with authenticity and empathy, exhibiting situational leadership and uh, uh, f fostering resilience uh, as a leader as well. I think a, a great uh, distillation of those things that, have, that clearly have worked well for you. Well, Deepika Rayala, thank you so much for spending time with me today, sharing a bit about your experiences, your, your two years now as a leader of Cornerstone On Demand, and a bit of the transformation that you and the team are leading, some of the exciting areas that you're getting involved with as well. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Peter. It was fun chatting with you and seeing you.